Hi everyone, I'm Mara Webster with sag After Foundation and thank you so much for tuning into another one of our conversations at home today. Um, I want to continue reminding everyone watching these videos that the sag After Foundation is a non-profit organization which is working to support sag After members who are currently out of work due to all the closed film and television productions right now. So we are continuing to raise funds for our COVID-19 emergency assistance fund. The details of this are below this video, so please check this out and consider supporting if you're able to in any way. This really helps people to pay their bills, make rent right now, and just make a huge, huge difference. Um, today, we're really excited to be joined by Sean Clifford, who's currently starring in the AMC show Quiz, um, which is based on the early 2000s scandal in the UK, which I actually didn't realize until I was talking to a bunch of American friends last night. They weren't as familiar with this news story, and a lot of them hadn't heard of it compared to UK counterparts. And I was curious if, if you found that through the journey of, of premiering the show in the UK and, and getting ready for the release at the end of this month in America. Yeah, I mean, it's a much bigger story over here. Um, you know, when when Charles Ingram, who uh, is played by the beautiful and brilliant Matthew McFadden, uh, who plays my husband, um, when he actually went on the show, it was the, the two days, he was on for two nights, and they were the two days prior to September the 11th. So it's understandable why um, that this wasn't, you know, a big story over in the States back then. Um, but it certainly was here. It totally gripped the nation. I remember it. I remember their faces, even though I wasn't, you know, I'm not someone that reads tabloid press, but you couldn't escape this story. It was absolutely everywhere. It was on every channel. It was on every single paper, even broadsheets, um, because it was just such a fascinating and bizarre story. And uh, yeah, it's been really exciting bringing it to life. And I'm actually really excited about sharing it with an American audience because I think this captures something of the eccentricity of Britishness, which I think is what Americans love about us, but you very rarely actually see it manifested in this way because it is something very specific to our culture. And uh, yeah, so it's very, very fun to play those characters and, and to get to be, you know, bringing them over to the States now. Yeah, and I actually, I genuinely didn't realize until um, I saw something where you were mentioning the fact that we never saw that episode, but everyone thinks that they did. Yeah. I, this blew my mind when I realized this last night. Um, and so I think there's a really interesting facet to the show in the way that it takes the mythology of what was there and actually really looks at grounding it in more of a reality. And so I was interested in, in the way that you and the rest of the, the cast and the creative team were really approaching it and, and thinking about it in that way. I mean, um, James Graham, who's our writer and creator, he's really, he's the keystone of this project. And he has been so methodical and thorough and, and also really sensitive to everyone involved. And, and he does this with all of his stories. And he really, he just wants to expose the truth. That's what he's really fascinated by. And what's interesting, most interesting probably about this story is that it is a period of history when our relationship with the truth really began to blur. And he um, has, and I think, I, I hope that people pick up on this, he's sort of laced our story with those ideas for us to sort of, you know, if we want some answers as to why we've arrived at the moment we're at now, historically, I think a lot of the seeds of it began then. That was when constructed reality I mean, we called it reality television then, but that's when that was bursting onto the scene. Big Brother um, and shows like that, that's when they were, you know, kind of taking over and they obviously changed the television landscape forever. It also changed how we consumed our media. Um, the news became more of a television show than about reporting. And so it captures... It captures all of those things. Um, I can't remember your original question, but uh, <laughs> what did you ask me? It was really about, you know, the idea of the mythology of, of what happened and what was yeah. created in the media, but finding a more grounded reality through the series. Yeah, I mean, there's the, there was so much written about this at the time, but it was very biased. It was very one-sided. It was, it was always in support of the prosecution and the, uh, the channel, essentially. Um, and they've controlled that narrative for nearly 20 years. And so this is an opportunity to show uh, another side to the story and a human side to this story, which I don't think up until now many people have considered, myself included. And it wasn't until I read James's script that 
I, you know, you don't have to dig very deep to see the human cost of this story and what happened to Charles and Diana and their family and the repercussions that they're still dealing with even now. Um, it's pretty shocking. And it's interesting because I think it's ruffled a few feathers this show. Um, but what's funny about it is, you know, the prosecution have had their say for nearly 20 years. And to be honest, this is a three act story that we present. And the first two acts are still in favor of the prosecution. So there's only just this tiny little slice, uh, which is our, our third act, where we pull the rug and we ask some massive questions that are honestly quite obvious, but we've just never considered before. And, and they do sort of undermine a lot of everything that's been set up and that's just by pulling a few tiny threads so it sort of just reveals how contentious this story is and um you know yeah raises a lot of questions i can't i can't say that it provides all the answers but uh yeah it's certainly it certainly uh left things very ambiguous for me yeah, and within the ambiguity and the fact that it is really raising questions more than necessarily delivering answers to the story, I was curious about the way that that played into the way that you thought about your performance and, and the way that you kind of needed to also keep that alive and, and create those questions through your actions on screen and, and also whether you felt a need to create foregone conclusions for yourself in your mind or if you had to keep open-ended for yourself. Yeah, we... we we just wanted to play the truth of James's script. That was like our number one. And honestly, James has captured something of their essence as human beings so beautifully in the script that that as a structure, just to lean back on that is did a lot of the work for me and Matthew, honestly. But um, for me, I wanted to be really sensitive to this person. Um, I'm, I do that with all my characters, but particularly when someone is still living and, um, you know, has agreed for this story to be dredged up, which I imagine is is not easy and um, and probably quite painful and all of those things. So I wanted to be sensitive, particularly because the more I discovered about this family and these people, uh, the more compassion I had for them. Um, so I didn't go anywhere near any of the press coverage um, because I just thought that would be very unhelpful. Diana was portrayed as this kind of Lady Macbeth character and I just intuitively knew that that wasn't who she was and that's just a very easy way to villainize women um, so I ignored that chose to ignore that and um, my main uh, resource was this wonderful documentary that was made about a year after their conviction which is it was like a half an hour special with um, someone called Fiona Bruce who's a presenter in the UK and and it was just like them at home and it was so personal and intimate and of course they're aware that there are cameras on them so there's going to be a, a certain level of facade that they put up like we all would um but that to me was the the most helpful sort of insight into into them as human beings um and that's obviously them post this whole crisis and um three years of, of their lives being turned upside down. So I had to, you know, bear that in mind. Um, but there's something, there's something very, um, I need to be careful with the word innocent here, but there's something, there's something quite naive about them or there was back then, you know, before they went through this experience, you can really tell. And it, and it does point towards their innocence because there seems to be, to be a genuine, um, surprise at how they were treated and and what went on and so I really wanted to get to the heart of that and what what drives a person to pursue this so obsessively and I think that's to do with the um, brilliance of the, the the show's formula which I think its simplicity makes you just think it's achievable and that you can do it you can answer those 15 questions. It's the same feeling that we all have when we watch that show. Uh, if you've ever watched it, you all just think you could do it. But I think if you, particularly if, you know, if your thing that you do is quizzes, then why wouldn't you think? No, but I definitely can. I can go on and I can see why if that was your hobby, as Diana describes it, like that, yeah, of course, that's why 
you would pursue that maybe and if you were introduced to ways to guarantee uh, yourself getting on the show or whatever like I think we all could have been guilty of taking advantage of those things and so um, again I've forgotten your original question but because <laughs> I love it no, yeah no you really answered it and I was interested in, in how you then you know taking that research process that you were just talking about and, and taking some of the footage and looking at, at pieces of information about them what, what that journey and process looked like and taking that information and really constructing her out as a character and who she was going to be behind closed doors. You know, what, what was her relationship with her husband, with her brother, with her father, with her kids? And what was yeah. her day-to-day -day life that, that was in existence before all of this happened? Well, I think, um, I mean, I did. I just observed her. I watched that documentary, I don't even know how many times, and I watched it every single day on set. I did, of course, watch the footage of her in the studio as well, because that's really useful. And actually the footage of her when she went on the show, because that predates everything. So that's, that's really useful. And I just, even just like observing someone's physical behaviors. So I often watched um, footage with the sound off to just watch her body language and look at how she interacted with her husband and her children and and those kind of things to just so that my actor instincts could take over and I could get to something that was truthful about her, that was about capturing an essence because we didn't want to, you know, do an impersonation. That's impossible. And I don't think would be interesting to watch. And there are, there are things that I took specifically from, you know, when they're in the studio, when Charles is playing, there are physical moments that I, that I um, took directly from her. And even when she's in the chair, I copy sort of everything that she does. But that's more for the enjoyment of people that know that footage really well. You know, they want to see those moments. But apart from that, I think you've got to embody a real human being. That's what this story was all about, is, is showing people who they were. So yeah, for me, it was about just watching her repeatedly and letting go of any preconceptions and just yeah seeing her as a human um being and what you know what kind of person is um traditionally into quizzes i mean not that i was generalizing i mean she's a real introvert diana she's very shy and she's she's very quiet and that's quite hard to play and also to make dramatic and interesting but it's something I can relate to um, you know I know lots of people that are like that and so you just kind of draw on that and use your imagination and yeah be sensitive to anything you can get your hands on without getting drawn into a narrative that's been painted by someone other than her yeah, and I really love the way that you and Matthew constructed the relationship between them because it feels like it was an important thing to to show, you know, moments of banality and just the ordinary everyday lives because these were ordinary people that something really extraordinary happened to you and very sensational. Um, and so how did the two of you set about crafting that relationship in a very real way? Because we see moments where they bicker, we see moments where they're just hanging out watching TV and just really making sure that you captured all of the different dynamics and layers of that relationship with the two of them. Honestly, I think a lot of that is is just to do with how Matthew and I connected um, personally. We we really hit it off immediately, and we had the exact same idea about who they were. And this is a couple that's still together, so that says a lot. And especially when they've been through something like this, so it was pretty clear early on that they're a unit and. Um, they're very different but they really complement each other in some ways and um, you know they've they've gone the distance and so um, yeah so we did we did talk about that a lot just that they clearly loved each other very much and and still do and um, and so we really yeah our main priority was to sort of capture some of that and to keep the the idea that at the heart of this story was a love story um, so that was something we discussed very early on before we even started filming I think 
Um, but again, it's all in James's script because those arguments, they come up like moments that are so organic um, for want of a better word. But, you know, that um, the argument that they have once they've been questioned by the police, I find that heartbreaking to watch even now, you know, um, because, you know, to imagine that, that someone in that way would put that kind of pressure on your marriage um, that has nothing to do with your life, you know, that a stranger can come in and say something like that. And it's just so upsetting even when I think about it. And we both got so upset when we were filming that, that scene. And, um, but yeah, Matthew is such a professional and uh, he certainly made me feel really safe with him. In fact, the scene where we're questioned is the first thing we shot together. That was the first scene um, that we did. And I think we were both really excited to work with one another. I'm a huge fan of Succession. He's a huge fan of Fleabag. So we were really excited to meet one another and, um, and were so, you know, joyful to be doing this job. And, and so it was actually, he made it very easy for me. I should give him all the credit. To be honest. <laughs> it also sounds like James had an opportunity to meet Charles and Diana kind of going into the process of this. Um, but I know that you and Matthew actually didn't meet them until you were at, at the end of filming. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you about, you know, details and, and pieces of information that, that James kind of almost passed on or, or shared or, or nuances that he helped guide you in, in his interactions. And then, you know, kind of when you met them, if it really solidified those choices that you felt like you had made in terms of building her as a character as to who she really was. Yeah, I mean, the uh, the idea to meet them at the end was to protect them and to protect us and protect the show um, because, like I say, we wanted to play the truth of James's version of events, which are very, very close to the truth. I mean, it's a show about truth, so, of course, he wanted to capture that with accuracy, but, that, you know, he's obviously taken a uh, poetic license here and there. But... Um, yeah, uh, yeah. James had spent a lot of time with them, actually, um, even when he was um, creating the play of this, because this was a play before it was a, a TV show. And he, he just, yeah, he, he just spent the time. He put the hours in and getting, getting to know them. And I think that's why the scripts captured something that felt so truthful and when meeting them, I mean, the thing that jumped out to me when I was observing her was this um, intangible kind of sweetness is the only way I can describe it. And I have to say that on meeting her, it absolutely radiates, radiates out of her. And so I was really, really pleased that I'd stuck to my guns and just let my intuition lead on that. And, and to be honest, that's how I approach all my characters. It's always about feeling. And uh, I always know if I've been miscast because <laughs> I'm like, oh no, this is this doesn't feel right in my body. I'm not gonna. This isn't this isn't working. But with Diana, it always there was this sweetness, but there's also something very contained about her. And so, um, it really was down to James capturing that in his. Uh, in his gorgeous script to to allow me to embody that I, I mean I can't give him I, like enough of the credit because he he really did all the legwork there and I'm really glad we did get to meet them but it was so brief I mean really like a few minutes and um, and it was very surreal because I'd known their faces for so long and um, but they were really they were happy that we were playing them and but you know, they were watching us reenact a scene that of their from their real life. I mean, I just can't even imagine what that's like. Um, I don't imagine it's very comfortable, but they seemed to um, really enjoy it. But yeah, that was certainly the sweetness was something that was solidified for sure when I met her. And um, you know, I think we all have hard edges, but it's interesting that that's, that's what was picked up on. And that was, you know, it's very easy to villainize people in that way. And I think they were quite easy targets for that. You know, class is such a massive thing um, in the UK. 
and their the perception of the Ingrams I think was very skewed just because of the way that they spoke so people made a lot of assumptions false assumptions about them and their background and their wealth and things like that um, and even I'm picking that that was the one thing I actually had to ask James about before we were before we started filming I said what what class bracket do they fall into because they speak like this but they don't seem to have any money and uh, it is such a big deal in this country and so capturing that that was that was one of the biggest challenges actually um, but you know just like all of us they that was the front that they presented you know it's like learning to speak a certain way in order to make people think that you're of a certain class as opposed to actually embodying it yeah I also really like the thoughtfulness in in James constructing this and that you know he involved people from both sides of, yeah. of the story and and you know within that I'm I was interested in the way that the scenes that he was able to construct about the genesis of the show and really understanding, you know, all of the stakes that were riding on it, especially for the people involved and why for them it became such a big deal and a big situation so quickly um, that obviously then became the media thing and, and how that was useful to you in terms of the context of your character and, and where she fit into the whole story. Yeah, I mean, it was just, it's, it's so... You know, I had no idea about where that sh the origins of the show. And I think it's really important that you understand why they are so emotionally invested and why they pursued the Ingrams so doggedly, rightly or wrongly. But that's what I love about this is it's so balanced. And I, I don't know how James has done it, but all parties are happy. And I think it probably is because he involved every single person that is featured um, from the beginning. And he consulted them. And I think, I think the most interesting stories are when your allegiances are tugged. That, you know, when you, you can see it from both sides, you, you have empathy from both sides, you understand why people behave in the way that they do, even if, you know, on a superficial level, it looks black and white. It's never that straightforward. And there was so much... Um, riding on this show for the channel and um, for Celador. So, yeah, I think that was really important. And that was really, you know, I had no idea about that. I had no idea about the syndicate, that, you know, they felt they were under attack. And you can see how that fed into their paranoia, you know, and why they were so adamant about uh, getting a conviction from, from this case. Um, it was, and that was what one of the most exciting things is that we came across new evidence whilst we were filming, um, which we were able to put into the show. And um, I'm not sure when this is going out, so I don't want to put any spoilers in. But um, yeah, there's there's some evidence that gets revealed in episode three, um, where Paul Smith meets Paddy Spooner, who's the um, the leader of the syndicate. Mm -hmm. And he, he provides him with two pieces of information, which were new pieces of information. And we've, we've put that meeting as happening at the time, but it actually happened whilst we were filming. Um, but what he tells him is, is absolutely true and was really shocking and exciting for us to discover whilst we were filming. Because oh, that would have made a massive difference at the time. And, you know, within that, you know, that kind of speaks to that this underground community that existed, yeah. people who were huge fanatics of the show and just massively, massively obsessed. And, and the way that, you know, even pre-internet chat rooms and connecting in that way and Zoom meetings, like they were, they were coming together across the country and sharing all these details and pieces of information and literally meeting up with each other and, and forging these relationships. And I was interested in, in kind of how you uncovered and, and learned about that whole side of, of it, you know, beyond what was just in the scripts and really understanding what was going on, you know, especially because it, it gives your character so much connection and so much joy. Well, there is a big question mark as to whether Diana was involved with the syndicate. So I didn't delve uh, very deeply into that. And actually, to be honest, James was our only source, um, direct source of information on that subject. Um, so 
apart from everything that he told us, and we did grill him um, about that, but more for our own morbid fascination, honestly, than um, to support the characters. So, yeah, because there's a big question mark, again, that was another, another alleyway I didn't want to go too far down because I felt it might influence things one way or the other. I mean, we often, I will say as well, like when we shot scenes, we often shot different versions, like whether things should look ambiguous, whether they should look guilty, whether they should look innocent. You know, that second episode, we really want to set up a heist. We want it to feel, you know, really tense and frightening and um, that they are trying to steal a million pounds in front of millions of people. And, and so we had to play the truth of that. Um, and there were some moments of that where even I felt uncomfortable because I knew we were doing it for dramatic effects. I understood how that played into the story and why that was exciting to watch. But I was also like, I don't want to be, you know, I want, I still want to be true to the story. But of course, this is how the story was presented. So we present it how everyone expects it. And then you, and then you start to unpick it. Um, but yeah, the syndicate, I didn't, other than, um, yeah, going, going down a wormhole with James, I didn't, I didn't dig too deep into that, um, particularly because of the new evidence that was revealed to us about that. So interesting. I wanted to ask you a little bit about, you know, the show's directing as well, because, you know, all three episodes were directed by Stephen Frears, which the legend. Know, <laughs> amazing to begin with, but also really fascinating because, you know, with television, usually, as you know, there's multiple directors, but I also, you know, realized that when you worked on Fleabag that you had one director for the whole season as well. And, and I was interested in how that's a really valuable thing tool for you because it happens so rarely and, and how it really helps in terms of that collaborative relationship. I think I'm really lucky because I've only ever done one job where I've had multiple directors and even then I only had two, mm -hmm. which was Vanity Fair. Um, but otherwise I've always had just one director. Um, I think it's really valuable. I, I do understand why they mix it up. But I also think if you want consistency and to create, you know, a holistic vision of, of something, of a show that you want to create, I do think it obviously it really helps if you, if you just have one person at the helm. Um, and Harry Bradbeer, yeah, I've got to give a shout out to him on Fleabag. He's just phenomenal and um, hope to work with him forever, you know. Um, it does really, because it creates trust. And, and absolutely with Stephen, um, I trusted him implicitly. I mean, he's a very, um, he's a very trusting director, actually. So he'll sort of, he, he it's very little interference from, from Stephen, from, from my perspective. And I think Matthew would say the same. And that he would, he's very delicate. So, and what he does is he's, it's all power to the actor, which is amazing because he'll just come over and he'll just ask a question just to plant an idea so that it is coming from you, which feels great, you know, because it doesn't, you know, feel like you're being, even though I love being directed, I love being given new ideas or a different way of looking at something because I want to, you know, tell the story in the best way possible, be the best I can be. And um, yeah, I absolutely loved working with Stephen again. I hope I get to work with him again and again because he's really, yeah, it's really subtle. He just, he won't, he won't say a thing unless he needs to. He'll just let you get on with it. And he trusts what you're bringing to the table. That's why he's cast you. And, and then just occasionally he'll come over and he'll say, oh, what's, uh, um, uh, what, what's just happened before this scene? And he'll say, oh, well, Oh, we've just come from there and he was like oh okay and what's happened there and you describe something and he and, he, and then he just would nod and say and then just peel off um but yeah he's funny and brilliant and yeah loved it and i i mean i he's obviously one of the reasons i was dying to do this job so yeah a real privilege to have gotten to work with him 
And in throughout the whole process of, of making this series, I wanted to just ask you about what you feel like you really learned and evolved in your craft as, a, as an actor from being on the show and developing this character. Um, I learned a huge amount from Matthew. I, on it, I can't, I can't say enough good things. I'm just going to sound like a sycophant, but he just, even just how he interacts on a set. He's so, he just strikes such a beautiful balance and he's so calm and he's cheeky. Um, I think there's got to be room for cheekiness, uh, you know, and the camaraderie of a set, I was just um, with a friend of mine this afternoon, um, socially distant, but uh, going for a walk in the park. And he's an actor. And uh, we were both just saying, you know, we miss the camaraderie of a set, of being on a set. It's just the best feeling ever. I'm never happier than when I'm on a set. Honestly, it's the best feeling. And, and Matthew just made it so joyful. And he, he really does make it look effortless. Um, and he really just gave me the confidence to just embody this person. And I think I did find it quite hard because there is something very small about this character. And it's not showy. It's not, it's not as showy a part as Charles or even um, as Chris Tarrant or anything like that. But she's still, you know, one of the, um, you know, principal characters as a lot of the story is riding on her. And, so that was quite challenging for me. And also there were a lot of moments where I was in isolation, where I was, you know, in the studio, I'm, I'm sat on my own. And I was sat on my own for two weeks in that, in that studio. And I found that really hard. But um, yeah, I learned so much about listening. And um, yeah, I mean, my whole approach to acting has completely changed, I would say, in the last three years, certainly. But specifically maybe in the last 12 months and that just comes from spending more time on sets uh, which I feel so lucky to be doing because I've wanted to do it for such a long time and just haven't been given the opportunity um, and yeah so every day I was learning new things and and it's not even about technique because that again isn't how I really approach my acting um, it's really about trusting yourself, trusting those instincts. And for me, there's a remembering going on. And Phoebe, well, Bridge and I have spoken about this, about remembering the actors that we were before the industry kind of stifled us. Um, and I, I used to make such big choices, bold choices around characters. And I forgot that for some, whatever reason. And, um, I really feel like I'm being given permission to rediscover that right now. And certainly on that job on quiz, I was, I was able to do that and it felt amazing. I'm so glad to hear that. And thank you so much for taking time to talk to us so in depth about working on the show. It's really wonderful. And I, I hope that everyone watching this will check out the whole series because it's so good. Oh, me too. Please do guys. I'm really proud of it. <laughs>